So I lived my whole life not knowing that I was autistic, um, was incredibly successful, had some lovely awards, which was fantastic, some of which for being a leader and, and a mentor. Um, wrote a book with other women about people from uh, marginalized backgrounds, typically um, being successful, people who were told there was no space at the table for them going, right, I'm going to make my own table, um, which is the Extraordinary Women book. And along the line, um, I was really fortunate to meet the Queen of the UK, which is always a lovely picture, um, for awards for our innovation in product. Um, and then to meet Prince Charles most recently when I was given an MBE, which is a huge honor. Um, the reason I say these things is, is partly because I think it's really important um, that if you are able to and be open and you are somebody at whatever level, then it helps um, typicalize the fact that there are so many of us actually in these industries like tech and um, all kinds of different industries that are maybe under the radar either because they, they don't feel confident in being their true selves or because they're afraid it might limit them in some way. And actually the, the book that you can see there, Black Ops, I was really um, honored to um, be asked to be a fictional character in a book, um, which is that one uh, written by uh, Professor Richard Benham and, and James Barrington, who are fantastic authors. And I loved the idea of having a central character in a book that's a bit like Dan Brown, um, kind of meets James Bond and so you've got a female James Bond and she happens to be autistic so I love stuff like that because I think it's really important but what's that got to do with why many of you are here which is well what's that got to do with business and why businesses want to do stuff with neurodivergent people all of a sudden why is neurodivergence and neurodiversity such a buzzword well that really comes down to what businesses are targeting for. Now, you will never see a board, and I'm on enough of them to know, go, do you know what we really want to do next year? We want to really aim for stagnation. We really, really want a mission statement that says we want to stop We're exactly the same, we don't want to make any additional profit, don't want any innovation, and actually we're, we're okay with resilience. That, that is never going to happen. But Typically, what happens with boards is they go, we want to be innovative, we want to think outside the box, but then what they actually mean is, from experience, we want to think to the outside edge of the box that we're comfortable with. And I think that that's an experience that many people that think differently will share with me, where occasionally you've said an idea and they're like, ooh, that's, that's a bit out there, isn't it? Um, and there's many ways that the British people say that's a bit out there, that, that a kind of polite but to me sharing another passion over on the side with uh, my little Ferengi friend groupthink is that root of stagnation and when when you're trying to address groupthink which is the tendency for people to uh, from similar backgrounds and experiences to to come up with similar ideas um, and ways of looking at the world groupthink is dealt with in a number of ways some of which can be having people from different ethnicities and different genders and different sexualities and different life experiences and different backgrounds all together around the same room. Um, but one thing doesn't necessarily equal another. You could have lots of different um, ethnicities, but they all may have come up through a similar um, background of education, and then that's going to affect how they think. Um, so what I love about neurodiversity and neurodivergence is there's a hardwired element to the different ways that we put data together. And so adding neurodiversity into the mix is a lovely way of, of working against groupthink. And groupthink um, is stagnation and neurodiversity, therefore, has going to have a, a positive uh, impact generally on innovation and resilience, um, as in looking at, at ways you might be under threat as a business, and profit. And that's been linked um, in numerous studies um, in terms of diversity and, and increases in profit and bottom line effectiveness, which is what businesses tend to be interested in. So what gets in the way of it? 
this is my most hated, and I, I don't often use the word hate, hated um, sentence in hiring people. And it is really commonly used. What do you want somebody who fits for the team? It's almost like a welcome map for groupthink, isn't it? Someone who fits with the team. What are the most likely people to fit with your existing team? Most likely people to fit with your existing team are people who think and act and probably look and experience the world just a bit like you. So one of the things that I try to suggest people reframe this as is someone the team can accommodate or someone the team can work with, which is different. There's an element of friction there, potentially. And friction is not always a bad thing. Sometimes it's a good thing. So, so part of the blockers that we have to diversity are these kind of tendencies to want to be surrounded by people that we find comfortable. Now that is more easily dealt with than the next one that I want to talk about. Now, I'm sure that everybody on this call has experienced bias in some way in their life. Some people have experienced it to a much greater degree than others. So you have people that are biased towards their own ethnicity. And by default, that means that you're disadvantaging people that aren't looking like you. You have people that are biased towards um, people that match their idea of what gender should look like or match their idea of what sexuality feels like. And, and all of those things are often subconscious. Even when you've got people that are good people with good intent, we do dumb things because we don't realize we're doing them. But this particular bias, this one called zero sum bias, is, is pernicious. It's insidious. And it's leftover junk that's in our 160 million year old operating system that is the human brain. And the zero sum bias, in summarized, <laughs> is the bias where I've got a big piece of cake. If I give somebody else a piece of cake, then I've got less. It's like a scarcity bias. And if you think about it, when we were on the African savannah and we were 160 million years ago, that kind of made sense. But along with that was, well, even though I might be the hunter and I need food to go and get more meat or whatever I'm getting, actually I need to give some of this to the potter or the wood turner or the person that's raising my children. And, and it was much more direct that fought against that. And now it isn't because we're sophisticated, apparently. So this zero sum bias is insidious because some recent research, which I've actually put on my Twitter feed and under Cyber Go Giver, um, talks about the fact that this bias even kicks in when it's not true, when literally if you helped the other set of people, it would be a win for you as well. The, the bias doesn't recognize that. There's really, really fascinating research that I suggest that you have a read around because it's like, how can we get past this? Because the conversations that we tend to have around equality and equity and leveling the playing field are exactly the sort of conversations that are going to potentially make this bias, this subconscious bias enacting people. That thing of, well, if I raise the bar for the people that are not getting a fair shake, then that means that my privilege goes away, doesn't it? And it enters into that awful, how do we change this? How do we get to more productive conversations? And I think most of the people, or, or hopefully a lot of the people on this call have seen something like this, you know, the, the equality versus equity. And it kind of, that's a nice image where you've got um, the difference between, you know, if you're short, shorter there, you, you, you need the boxes to be able to see and, and it doesn't disadvantage the, the fellow that had the box that could see anyway. And you kind of go, oh, that kind of makes sense. But I can guarantee you that this, the bias that we talked about previously, the zero sum bias would have the guy who had a box go, well, but, but that was my box. You've taken it away. You probably all felt like that at some stage, even if you wouldn't want to admit it. Now, that's really hard to deal with, isn't it? Because 
people talk about equality a lot when they talk about diversity and inclusion. And I was actually <laughs> at a UK government event yesterday on a panel. And I said, I don't like equality because it's unfair, which is a really bizarre statement to make, isn't it? But equality would mean that if you were in a business and you had some reflective thinkers and some instantaneous thinkers, that you would go, well, everybody gets the training course information when you turn up because that's how it's done. Whereas equity would go, I want everybody to be able to thrive and to be contributing at their highest level because that's in the benefit of everybody. So those people who have said that they would like the information and the training course up front so that they can digest it and reflect on it will get that. Now, even though instantaneous thinkers will go, well, I wouldn't read it if you gave it me early, they will feel like they're being disadvantaged. So everybody gets the information um, and that's inclusion by design towards equity. Can you see the sort of examples I'm, I'm talking about? So when you have this kind of inclusion by design, people can be more productive because everybody gets to feel engaged. Everybody gets to feel included. And inclusion by design is, is generally a little bit easier <laughs> when you look at it from the point of view of how, how can we change a process without actually impacting anybody, but that, that levels that playing field. What's harder is when you think you're leveling the playing field, but because you're not part of um, the group that you're trying to help, you don't realize it's not being seen in the way that you intended it to be. So a great example of this was I was at an event and it was mainly neurodivergent folks. And at the time I didn't know I was autistic. So I was a neurotypical as far as I was concerned employer. And I was going, well, you know, we've got our diversity statement and it says that we, you know, everybody, everybody's going to get a fair shake and isn't it fantastic. And somebody kind of came up to me in the coffee break and they said, do you know what? Everybody's got one of those. So kind of for, neuro, for me, neurodiversity statements are like buttholes. Everybody's got one and they're normally full of, and you can imagine the rest of the sentence. Um, and it really gave me pause because I, I was thinking of it from a position of privilege. I was thinking, well, it says that we we be held accountable. So, and the law says we've got to be held accountable. So that's enough, right? And it turns out it wasn't. And what some of the autistic folks there said and, and some of the other folks too, was actually, unless there is a very specific welcome mat saying something along the lines of what I've written here, which is neurodivergent applicants welcome, and ideally saying what kind of accommodations this organization might make, um, I'm, I'm going to be thinking, is this a toxic landing spot or not? Isn't that thought provoking? <laughs> Isn't that the shared experience of many of the people on this call? So I thought about it. And then because I'm one of those people that now know I am autistic and I fall down rabbit holes, I thought, well, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and look at, you know, 160 or so job adverts from Indeed and Read and all those other places. And I'm going to see if any companies are actually doing this. And the answer was no companies were doing that. Donuts and whether you got free coffee was more important than saying, hey, we can make your interview process comfortable so that you can show your best self and, and have a, a good opportunity of being hired. So this is one of those things that I'd love people to go away and take away and, and, and think about in terms of what could you do tomorrow to change this? Because a process isn't the same as, as you know, those kind of things. But if you look at that statement, it's also very likely to be the sort of one that, that would kind of kick off that zero something. So you have to make a decision. Are you OK with that? And on that basis, um, one of the reasons that I got to find that out was because I was able to have a really open and honest conversation about how far away from reality my misconception was. And that is what life is like for many people in the workplace, particularly people that don't feel that they can be their authentic self for whatever reason. And um, this is actually a little slide that I have in my slide deck um, for imposter syndrome, but I thought it really 
resonated with me in terms of our conversation here. Because this is the reality of masking for an autistic person or not letting somebody know that the 56 page document you've just sent to a dyslexic is going to be more painful for them for anybody else. And, you know, is there an easier way, please, <laughs> or, or whatever it might be. The, the reality is we tend not to show all of our pain points in work because we, we, we're often worried that it may disadvantage us. And that actually gets in the way for businesses of high performing teams and productivity and letting people thrive. So, you know, I, I'm kind of like, well, how can we make this thing called diversity almost as accepted as a fire alarm test or putting a safety belt on to travel in your car it's something that everybody would go that's what we do and when i was thinking about the things we currently do which is talk about disadvantage and leveling the playing field and giving people extra boxes to stand on and how that triggers this um, bias i was thinking well what, what if we approached diversity and inclusion differently and we and we looked at it in terms of a, a, a much wider um, inclusion by design type of business and and that became more of my vision in terms of I looked at Maslow's hierarchy of employee engagement and actually said well if high performing teams are at the top and people that are probably struggling to be in our business and would like to leave our business and would leave our business, even though they have capability and capacity at the bottom, does that apply to everybody? And actually, I realized quite quickly that yes, it does. So actually siloing people out and going all oh, may not be as effective as really getting to the crux of what, why are we having some of these challenges where people don't feel able to be their authentic selves. And, and that led me to a, a favorite um, book of mine called First Break All the Rules. Um, and the reason, again, I love it is because it's based on data. It's the highest performing teams across the globe in the most successful businesses. And it was analyzed by Gallup. And essentially what they found is when you let people do the things they do best for the majority of their time, you get high performing teams. And that's what a manager's best job is. And I've really summarized it. To give you an example of that, um, typical rules in an organization, let's say you look at uh, a football team. I use a British football team because I'm not sure if the positions of an American football team, but let's say you've got a, a center forward or a quarterback, and that person is the, the best person that running down the field and sticking a ball through the goal. Now, a good manager would let that quarterback practice all their quarterback skills 100% of the time and they might have some how do we integrate that with the rest of the team and make everybody work for themselves in the position they do best at their most effectiveness and still get them all together that's how our high performing sports team works what do we do in business with our high performers well you take the quarterback and you say well I noticed you're really bad in defense so what I'm going to do is I'm going to write you up um, a thing about your weaknesses and we're going to work on that exclusively until you're average and I hope that you're feeling really rewarded by that process now if anybody's been in a business like that I think we all have you will recognize that scenario as the appraisal system and so what what first break all the rules is and 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 what the, the next slide talks about is is taking that concept and applying it at, at grassroots level to inclusion and design and, and diversity and equity, because actually the amount of people that I speak to that are neurodivergent and they fail in the, in the business, the business fails to provide them with the equivalent of air and water, um, air, water and food, your basic needs to survive in a business. You know, that's a toxic environment. So do I know what's expected of me? Has the information of what I'm supposed to be doing in my job been given to me in a way that I understand and is clear? And do I have the tools and equipment to do that job right? That's like basic stuff that we're failing on. And then you go up that hierarchy. And I could spend a lot of time talking about that, which we haven't got today. 
But essentially what we're talking about is hiring to to folks for their talents and working with them to let them do what they do best for the majority of their time. Defining goals, not processes, building up and nurturing those talents and helping them navigate their way to success and thriving, because that is in all of our interests without kicking off this self-destructive, poor programming left over from our 160 million year old brain. I'd like to leave you with just kind of three slides. Um, one, how to create a diversity friendly environment must include the people that you want to support when you're working out what these processes might be. Um, if you want more detail on that, just have a look at the word NAWU, nothing about us without us, founded from the disability movement, but effectively what it says at grassroots is, policies need to be created with the full and direct participation of the people that are affected by them. Visions of where the business goes needs to be done with the people in the business. Otherwise, you won't get the engagement that will let you succeed. Takeaways, just summarizing what I've said. Can the team grow to include this person? Addressing that horrible, um, <laughs> the person fit with the team question. Include people by design, not by individual silos. It should be something that's good for everybody, ideally. Diverse companies are more successful and groupthink is the death of any business long-term. Um, again, haven't got time to go into everything. Um, in this uh, slide deck, that these books are all books that I love, cherish and treasure. Um, they have many, many shortcuts to success and, and things that at least open up productive conversations with, with people on how can we make an environment that everybody can thrive in work. And thank you. I'm really looking forward to um, hosting a panel shortly and answering any questions you might have. And cheers. And I'm CyberGoGiver on Twitter if you need to look me up afterwards and some of those links that I've mentioned are on there too.